Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Macro Podcast. I have a returning guest, uh, my friend Mark McGrath. Uh, Mark, thank you for uh, coming back on the show. Um, it felt like we just, I mean, maybe scratched a a pinprick uh, of of what we were going to discuss on OODA Loop, and I was uh, excited to bring you back and talk a little bit about about OODA Loops and a little bit more specific application area. Um, and Mark, just to tee us off today, if you were not aware of an OODA loop or you didn't know what it was about and somebody was trying to pitch it to you, if, if you will, what would be the number one benefit that they would receive by integrating OODA loops into their world? Mm. The first thing, great question. The first thing is acknowledgement and acceptance that you're going through the process of OODA, whether you're aware of it or not. Mm. So when we talk about OODA, we're talking about humans that make observations, decisions, and actions. And I'm not yet aware of any environment where humans are involved, where they're not making observations, decisions, and actions. And we talked about last time, that's one of the big distinctions that I make, that when we effectively understand that this is going on all the time, and we understand the process, and we stop looking at OODA loop as a process or a function, and we start looking at the OODA loop sketch in quotes as, as John Boyd had it, we come to know that it's basically an illustration of how our orientation functions within whatever domain we're in, whether I'm sitting here in my office um, recording a podcast with you, or if I'm running the grocery store, or if I'm trading, or if I'm playing hockey or basketball or anything. Uda is going to be going on as a, a, continuously because I, as a human, have an orientation, which in turn is shaping how I observe, how I decide, and and how I act. So that's a hurdle that a lot have not or or won't go, get over, or they have to they have to accept that or come to understand that, and then they can explore it more deeply. I think once they get it that. I, I tell people this all the time. Hey, you're doing this anyway with 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 or without understanding. You're 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 observing, orienting, deciding, and acting and learning from it or not learning from it, whether whether you speak with me or not, or whether we work together on it or not. You're you're subject to all of this. Mm -hmm. So that's a big point that Hunter Hastings and I made when we were discussing this uh in our in our paper that you've uh graciously shared, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. Um, and as we talked about things like the adaptive entrepreneurial model, you could cross that entrepreneurial and you could put the adaptive basketball model, the adaptive mm -hmm. real estate trading model, the adaptive trend following model, the adaptive race racing model. It doesn't matter because you're going to be subject to the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, the laws of economics, the laws of gravity. You're subject to all of those things and you have to operate within those frameworks and, and constraints. And the more that you understand those things, so I guess number one would be I have to accept it. And then number two is I endeavor to continue to continually understand it better. Then I can get better at it. And then I understand how my observations are shaped, how my decisions and actions are shaped, and, and ultimately how my learning is shaped. I mean, that's really what it is. Orientation shapes. Mm. And everybody has an orientation. And they're all unique. And there might be areas where we have common ground. You know, we are where our orientations align, you know, we might both like trend following or we mm. might, might both like uh, real estate investing yeah. or we, we might align, uh, intersect our orientation such that we could form a team or a company or a Marine Corps, right? Mm. Where we subscribe to certain things where there's alignment amongst the, you know, the many different, different orientations of each individual. Mm. Um, and I, again, that's a, it's sort of a different way of looking at it, but I think it's, it's getting, I see it as getting on the road to sort of unleashing the power of UDA. And if you've, mm. you know, for those that have, have done deeper study on it, um, maybe a beginning place would be Boyd, the fighter pilot that changed the art of war mm. by, by Robert Corum. When, when Boyd and one of his, uh, one of his friends and they were called the acolytes, his, uh, inner circle a uh, guy by the name of chuck spinney when they were developing uda as we understand it in the diagram you know as we see it in the you know observe orient decide act with you know the orientation depicted with the 
uh, sort of the pentagram, pentagon shape with cultural traditions, genetic heritage, analysis, and synthesis, et cetera, that they thought about classifying it because sound, sound awareness and understanding of it unleashes human cognitive power um, unlike, unlike anything else that I'm familiar with at this point. Um, and, and it feels like to me that there's a, a parallel to theory of constraints here in that in a, in a sense, you're, you're using UDA to basically identify the top constraint that you're working on. So you're, it's, it's kind of like a sorting discipline almost, it feels like maybe in a way. Because the various constraints that I have will be in my orientation. Mm. They'll be considered in my orientation. My, my, my orientation is going to be a repository or is a repository for constraints, for rules, regulations, ethics, morals, um, know-how, procedural know-how, tactical know-how, strategic understanding. All of that resides in my, my orientation, mm -hmm. how I make sense of things how I process things, everything is going to be inside my orientation. So as, as it shapes, remember on the UDA diagram, orientation, uh, do you want me to share the screen? We could yeah, yeah, up. for sure. Let's, let's do that. We, we could pull up Make UDA. Sure and do that. But if you remember, but if you remember that um, orientation implicitly guides and controls, that's a, that's a key part. I, I think that's probably, people really have to take that away. You've got to take away the, um, um, let me see if I can pull it up here. The part where it says implicit guidance and control, mm -hmm. because what that's telling you is that your OODA loop shapes, your orientation rather, not your OODA loop, your orientation shapes uh, what it is that you see why don't you pause it for one second okay, and sure. I'll, uh, I'll pull it up here. Doesn't that mean? Okay. Now we sorted out our, our tech here and I'm going to share this document. Okay. We were talking about the OODA loop. Mm. All right. How does that look? That's fantastic. Okay, perfect. Let me just get a little annotator tool here. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about here. So so the implicit guidance and control, that's really the that's the component that most people, when they look at OODA or OODA loop, and they look at it as a reduced process that we try to apply in certain situations and we try to look for or we're trying to cycle through. They don't, they, they see, observe, orient, decide, act just as a continuous loop and try to pump up that speed. And it's, that's, that's a, that's a very reduced approach to the power of it. So I start with, as we talked about last time, you know, we talk about orientation as our own internal processor, our own internal operating system from which we observe, decide, and act. And our orientation, so who we are, what we read, what we believe, what we think, our emotional state, our psychological state, our cognitive biases, our understanding of certain mental models and frameworks mm -hmm. and everything, all of that resides in here. Mm -hmm. He listed five things. There's there's more. I mean, but but summing it up nicely, there's five things that are simultaneously the, the lines that form the Pentagon and the star. That just suggests that they're constantly cross-referencing each other continuously. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that process doesn't stop. Most importantly... It implicitly guides and controls or shapes how you observe within your environment. So if I'm a trend following trader and I've studied all of Michael Covell's books and I've read all the Jack Schwager books and I look at markets every day and I read Jack Schwager's book on futures and I trade futures and I, you know, this and that, all of that's in here. And that in turn shapes or implicitly guides and controls how I see things within my market, within my environment, within my system, my trading system, right? That's all going to shape how I see things. It's also going to shape how I decide mm -hmm. and how I act. It implicitly guides and controls how we act. And we were talking last time, you had kind of asked, and I didn't really get into it too deeply, but ultimately this is occurring in time, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is advancing in time and we're trying to compress our time scale 
as best as we can to stay uh, stay aligned with the rate of change, the mm. rate of markets, the rate of competitors or faster than competitors. So some things we know immediately because of our training, because of our education, we can just do. We don't have to, we don't have to go through the, um, the whole, the whole process. I, I can just do these things reflexively. The example mm -hmm. I always like to give is a, a fighter pilot ejecting out of a, a troubled aircraft yeah. does not have to think about it. They know immediately what to do. If they don't, if they hesitate and they elongate their time scale, their, their, their race against the clock is going to, they're going to come on the wrong side and they're not going right. to be able to get out of the plane in time. So there's just some things, you know, I think is, there's things as a trader, there's things in real estate, there's things as a, an attorney, right? There's things that, you know, that you can just do, you don't have to think about it. You just, just do it, you know? So that's a, that's a key part to really understand what that means. These parts, implicit guidance and control that's from the inside out. Mm -hmm. That's from our operating system within as, as we look out. And what I have to know, what I have to understand is that everything that I read, right? So if I, this is my, it's just some of my trading and market psychology <laughs> shells, right? All of that stuff gets uploaded into this. All of that stuff gets uploaded into my orientation. And that in turn enables me to observe things differently than someone that hadn't read trend following or the complete turtle trader or the market wizards or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to your point about I'm scanning my environment and I'm looking for gaps. I'm looking for mismatches. The mismatches are what I want to find. I don't want everything to be swimmingly. I want, I want to find mm. opportunities. I want to find gaps. And the only way I can do that is through the scanning of my environment and having that sort of awareness uh, refined and revised and updated inside of my my orientation. That's going to empower me to see opportunities where others don't. I mean, have you ever traded derivatives, right? Like futures right. or options and people say, that's insane. That's crazy. I would never do that. Well, what they're saying is essentially that something in their orientation, uh, maybe pre previous experience, right? Maybe their psychological or emotional state, or maybe their just lack of information or their lack of education mm -hmm. shapes how they see trend following. Oh, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's uh, alchemy or, you know, it's, uh, it's dangerous. It's too risky, right? Yeah. That is being shaped by their orientation. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. does. And I was just thinking of how, uh, you know, Warren and Charlie often, often stress uh, temperament. And yeah. it seems like genetic heritage almost is a temperament issue. Uh, I'm sure you can improve your temperament, of course. I do believe in that. But but just your default uh, temperament is important in terms of trading. I, I think that that is a yes, absolutely. So so who I am, what I think, how I think, my, my temperament, my 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 cool head, my mm. my nervousness, my 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 shock and horror, my mm. my. Uh, you know, my, my static thinking, whatever it is, it's all going to, it's all going to reside inside of my operating system, which affects how I see things and how I act within it. And I'm also fascinated, um, which one has the, the best lever. Uh, it seems like the genetic might be to an extent limited what you can do with that, but it feels like analysis and synthesis and new information feels like those, especially, are where uh, you have a nice lever. You, I mean, if you literally stay committed to continue and learn, continual learning, that's how you can con continue to improve your OODA loop. Essentially, is you're, you're like, hey, you know, if you say, well, I know this, and it's it's that uh, great Mark Twain quote again. It's not mm. what you know that it gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know and just ain't so. And mm. I think this is like, a, I'm so I'm like literally like geeking out all of a sudden because I'm realizing. Okay, this is this is like really a, a fantastic point about the OODA loop is the new information uh, lever that you have. Yeah. And just remember, this should say, yeah, it says John Boyd's OODA loop if you pull it up on Wikipedia. Yeah. But using his way, OODA loop sketch, like it's not a loop. It's it, it it's called OODA loop because it's just that's that's what people call it in the way mm -hmm. it, the way it's the way it's been uh, talked about so much because, you know, people like acronyms, too, especially mm -hmm. in the military. Mm -hmm. It's a ongoing, complex, multifaceted, multivariant process mm -hmm. that 
has multi dimensions. It's not uh, a flat pattern loop. So like speak. this feels so, like a system, uh, like a, a like more like a systems dynamics uh, thing, a little bit more multi variable than. Yeah. Yeah. This is a this is his his way of explaining and beginning the conversation really. Yeah. Um, sort of sketching out what it means and. Um, I think I told you I was in the archives recently with my friend uh, Pontrevera, who is mm. a John Boyd scholar that you might oh, have, to have on the on the show as well. Oh my gosh, I need to get get a hold of Ponch if I can because I, I just, his information is marrying like lean and agile stuff. Yeah, and, uh, where our growth path is someday that 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 might be super relevant to what we're working on, and I'm so excited to hear what his uh, his take on things as well. So he and I spent a full day in the Boyd Archives at uh, Marine Corps University um, going through mostly his handwritten notes. I did get to see his copy of Klaus, one of his copies of On War by Clausewitz oh, with all his nice. marginalia, which was just phenomenal. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, he's wearing the white no. gloves and really kind of shaking <laughs> just because, yeah, like, you know, John Boyd's my hero. Yeah. And, and this has been so influential to me for, you know, now more than half my life um and and still what i've learned and 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 punch would tell you is we're sitting in there and we're going through these notes this guy never stopped learning john mm -hmm. boyd absolutely did not stop and one of the things they hated publishing and why he only has the one paper uh destruction creation published was because he was afraid if something was published, it was set in stone. Mm. And he thought that nothing should be set in stone, that the right. nature of the universe was dynamic. So when you're in there, I mean, I, I think you may have seen the pictures I put up on LinkedIn. I can throw them back up. Yes. The, the, the various iterations of, I mean, hundreds of examples of him drawing this out and and you can see him using various codes of his various briefs like patterns of conflict and conceptual spiral mm. and he's mapping and drawing all this out by hand and this is the final that he left you know before he because this was about say um 1996 and he, he left us in 1997 mm. um early early in the year i think in march of 97 and I was wondering, Ponch and I were talking about this as we're going through all this stuff. Boy, where was he headed? What was he? Oh, yeah. What was he chasing after? Yeah. Um, and if you read his bio, uh, was one of the things that is fascinating about him, you know, he was the, he's arguably one of the greatest fighter pilots that ever lived from mm -hmm. a skills and technique standpoint. Um, he wrote the aerial attack study. We talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. But at, at some point in his career, um, his his friends that were higher up were trying to keep him. Uh, keep his flight status you know yeah. keep him keep flying him and he just yeah and he just got to the point where he says ah i'm i'm on to other things i've already yeah. done that yeah. and he let his flight status lapse so he could pursue his uh his vision of this learning model and you know what he was he was he was thinking of something it says in the book he was thinking about something that could affect all of us mm. in every aspects of our life so yeah. as you're going through all the stuff in the archives you realize yeah this guy wasn't just thinking of dog fights and this guy wasn't just thinking about ground combat and this guy wasn't just thinking about running a, a company with a toyota production system or anything mm. like that all of that came from his pursuit whatever he was pursuing and i think that that's really his challenge and that's why i've devote I, why I continue to devote so much time mm -hmm. and really trying to understand it because it's such an open-ended, it's such an open-ended uh, theory that we can, you know, the, the people that I like say Ponch, for example, yeah. I mean, we're, we're on this mission to continue to develop it and, and bring it to as many people as possible. I feel like that's the path that Boyd was on. Like it the is, more I, it's interesting too. I, I keep thinking of the quote we, uh, about, we don't, we don't, I can't quite remember the quote, but essentially is we, we want, we're seeking what the master sought. So instead of, you know, just give me the information, it's like, what, what were they really after? So it gave you a chance to seek what the master sought. And that, that, that's fascinating. One, one of the things that he says in patterns of conflict, and I could pull that up and um, I don't want to butcher it, but basically the way I say it, and it's in it's in powers of conflict. I'm not here to hand out recipes. If you're looking for recipes and formulas, I'm not your guy. And neither is John keep Boyd. Moving. Yeah, keep keep moving. Keep on moving. If 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 you're not 
you know, like, like trading would be a really interesting example. Like if, if you think that there's some trend following codex, I can just hand it to you and you're good. You don't have to do anything. You're going to be in a lot of trouble because you're looking for prescriptions. You're looking mm. for formulas. I tell people I teach, don't look for prescriptions, look for subscriptions. Mm -hmm. I subscribe. I'm trying. And I think that Boyd was getting us to subscribe to big ideas mm. that, affect us all and everything that we do. So, you know, his, his fusion, his synthesis was taking second law of thermodynamics, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to give us a method of learning and engaging within our, within our environments. That's belief at a high level. I have to subscribe it, to that. It's eerie to me that I, I never made this uh, I'm like dopamine hit going big time right now. It just dawns on me that basically Charlie Munger's mental models and, and Boyd are basically talking about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's the mental models that you that you in, integrate in your loop. Um, and it seems like to me there's there's definitely a connection there between what Boyd is talking about and what Charlie's talking about in terms of you know, what are, what are you using as a mental lattice, if you will? And I'm like, wow. Yeah, it's a map. Yeah. I, mean, I think, think of, think of OODA loop as a map only. Don't think yeah. of it as a process. Think of OODA as a process. OODA is the pro, here's how I, I think we said last time, orientation. OODA is the process of orientation. What you see before you on the screen is a map of how our orientation functions inside of our environment. That's a, that's a very differentiated approach, right? So again, that's subscriptive and it gets down to prescriptive. We're going to have prescriptions. We're going to have formulas. We're going to have trading systems. We're going to have mm -hmm. trading techniques. There's going to be different things that we have to do, but all of that has to flow from our, our big ideas. It has to flow from our principles. It has to flow from things that are always going to be true or that we're subject to, because that's how we harness that's how we tap into the waves and the energy and things of the universe. We can't go around. I used to get this all the time. Like, Hey, great talk, but man, you didn't tell me to do anything. Like you didn't give me anything that I can go do because what they were looking for yeah. was some kind of a silver bullet or yeah. some kind of a magic bean that they could run back and plant and all their business problems are going to be solved. That's not yeah. how it works. No, not at all. And Mark, I'm fascinated. If you were, um, I, I think we should deep deep dive into this. I, I feel like the trend following model, it, trend feels like it's 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 a natural companion uh, of the OODA loop, and we've talked about that before. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see the the integration of OODA and trend following? Trend following is I'm fascinated by it. Um, I, I think that trend following. I would recommend people read the book by the books by Michael Covell. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great place to start. And I know that, you know, that's a good entry point, right? Mm -hmm. People can figure out uh, what's right for them over the long run. But for someone that li li knows literally, literally nothing about it, or, or, you know, someone that's trying to learn about it, um, I, his books are the best that I'm aware of. Um, and I'm biased because that's, those were the books that were recommended to me. Mm -hmm. Um but as you know, almost twenty years, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so like the complete turtle trader. What it what hit me as someone that's familiar with the, with John Boyd was that here is a differentiated orientation of. Uh, Richard Dennis and William Eckhart, and and they're going to share or teach or upload their orientation into the the turtle students, and they're going to see markets differently. They're going to, and if, if if you remember from the story, uh, they weren't all into investments. You know, they mm. came from various backgrounds. I think they even had an Air Force pilot. Um, <laughs> that kind of speaking of John Boyd, yeah, and. As I was reading that book and, and, and in that, that book that Michael Covell has, it you know talks about the, the principles and the philosophy. I'm like, well, this is a this is a differentiated orientation, which in turn shapes how uh trend following traders in the school of Dennis and Eckhart there, um, trend following traders are gonna have a differentiated observation. Their observations are gonna be shaped differently 
because they're tuning out a lot of the distortion fields, right? A lot of people mm. are getting all their information from other things, or they don't have a rules base. If you remember the turtle traders, um, it was a very clear rules based system mm -hmm. that sought to eliminate um, emotion and psychology and, and, and other things. So I was captivated by that. And then I just started digging and digging on that. And yeah, thank you for that one. I haven't read that one. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking that one out. I'm <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm doing as soon as I get off of here. Well, you can link to the. There's a great YouTube summary of it uh, to get people started. Nice. And, um, that's usually the one. Like for somebody that doesn't have any industry knowledge, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say start there. Um, but then when you get to, you know, when you get to trend following, I mean, I, there's so much tape. You can see all the tape. Oh wow, yeah. I have on this book in <laughs> in marginalia. You can ask my yeah. wife that. I sometimes sleep with this thing. Right? There's, 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 there's two books that I've slept with a yeah. lot. And this yeah. is one. And the other one is uh, Franzo Singa's uh, dissertation on the theories of John Boyd, uh, oh, science, wow. strategy, and war. Wow. And what's interesting, if I would tell any trend follower, I tell any trader of any discipline, really, I would read John Boyd's, uh, I would read Discourse on Winning and Losing. Um, I would read Franzo Singa's science, strategy, and war. I would read the Marine Corps doctrinal publications, war fighting, mm -hmm. um, uh, war fighting, learning and competing. Wow. And I would, you know, I could, I could walk anybody in any discipline, really any industry through those and show them that, Hey, look, you're subject to all these things and your tax dollars paid for it. I always tell people that yeah. if it's, if it's the Marine publications, that's right. You, you can extract these principles and you can apply them to li literally everything no matter what you're doing. Um, my mother knits, like she's a professional knitter. Mm -hmm. We're talking, I, I showed her how the theories of Boyd and war fighting and you know, how it applies to knitting, but back to trend following, when you go through that book. Um, so when you, when you're ready to graduate to the next level and you read any books and, and you know, there's Jack Swagger books mm -hmm. and there's uh, Larry Height has a great book um at psychota i mean there's a lot of them right? yeah i've got uh, a friend of mine uh, let me his copy of the ed sequoia book um yeah oof, wow the trading tribe or the yeah, yeah i mean you this know, one is uh man i can't remember the title it's uh the 39th day book uh i don't know if you've seen that one um it's more uh expositional it's kind of, i think it was like his latest like last you know swan song type book almost like but anyway, um, so I started, I started digging through these books, yeah. right? And, and it made total sense to me, you know, coming from where I came from, it was very differentiated. Um, but parallel to Boyd, if you're trading, right? I mean, rapid decision making, mm -hmm. like you have to have a system with rules that are clear and concise so that when something happens or, you know, you're either ready for it because you are proactive or you know how to react uh, faster than others um being flexible and adaptable you know markets are always changing markets change constantly it turns on and it never go, turns off right it's constantly in a state of flux so being adaptable to that being able to modify your approach again not just in trading in a in a basketball game i have to be flexible and adaptable if the team that we're playing is doing something that i didn't expect i'm going to mm -hmm. have to adapt to that and adjust to that um you know, you you mentioned earlier we we're talking about analysis and th synthesis inside of the inside of the orientation. That's really the big part is the synthesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, a, a lot of people in trading and basketball and football and whatever the discipline, a lot of them are very good analysts. They can break things down to their core components, right? And they can tell you, but then once you've broken all that apart. What could you fuse together to create novelty, to create something that didn't previously exist? And if you recall from John Boyd, that was taking a you know bicycle, a skier yeah. on the slopes, to, uh, yeah, and, and creating a snowmobile. I, I started seeing like trend following systems or trading systems as sort of a snowmobile, you know, mm -hmm. like taking these things that that strip out a lot of the emotion and whatever, and um, fuse together an approach that allows me to interact with markets without having to weigh in my own opinions or emotional state and removing all that um, chance for human error. I don't know. It just made a lot of uh, sense. Like if, if, you know, boy, to talk about being anticipatory, right. We, we want to anticipate things. We want to be ready for things and be flexible mm -hmm. to, to execute various courses of action. 
I mean, I feel like as I continue to be a student of trading, I feel like that's very pertinent, you know, being and, able to. And I'm fascinated um, this, this topic for myself and for others. I wonder um, any tips on in, in, including improving your synthesis skills. Uh, and I've never really asked myself that question. I read a lot. So hopefully that's, that's happening naturally as a, as a consequence of just reading a bunch of different, you know, anywhere from neuro linguistic programming, pro programming to uh, nonlinear dynamics. Uh, so everything across the waterfront there. So it, it gives you an exposure to different models, but I'm fascinated. Uh, what would you say if somebody is really interested in, I, mean, I really want to get better at synthesizing. Is, has there been anything that you've come across along the way that say, hey, if you do these kind of things, this is a good way to uh, build that muscle? What a, what a great question. And I, I have my own answer um that worked for me you think of synthesis as creativity mm -hmm. where do we create I, I presented this at the Mises Institute in my, in my paper last March and that was one of the questions where does creativity fit in mm. Cre creativity is your ability to synthesize mm. when you when you when you analyze and break things down your creativity comes with the, the being able to synthesize and filling a void or addressing a mismatch, addressing a addressing a gap with that creation, whatever it is. I always tell people like when I work with them, you know, one on one with leaders or with small teams or if I'm speaking to a big company, right? Understanding John Boyd's theories, again, whether you're a trend following trader or a real estate trader or a real estate investor, it doesn't matter. Understanding uh, uh, John Boyd's theories are going to make you more creative, more competitive, uh, more collaborative with the people that you interact with, and more cooperative with, um, you know, strategic partners and, and things like that. Kind of like, you know, we're cooperating to get this get this podcast out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it feels creativity like and the innovation is key. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you asked me how do you how do you do it? So yeah. for me, I started digging deeply on uh the books of Stephen Pressfield mm. and I had been familiar with his book Gates of Fire it was on the commandant's reading list um which I always try to keep apprised of even though I've been out of the Marines for so long right um because a lot of those books are designed to help mindset and how you how you think um remember this is all a way of thinking mm -hmm. but his book The War of Art Turning Pro um put your ass where your heart wants to be Ooh. uh do the do the work um the authentic swing uh um, nobody wants to read your blank um <laughs> those books really challenged me in the sense of like my my creative sense like trying mm -hmm. to bring out my, my my creative sense and a lot of people have talked about that book the war of art a lot of comedians have read it a lot mm -hmm. of uh, artists have read it um art is a tremendous area to talk about the the theory of john boyd um but 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 pressfield's um stories and ideas another one he wrote called the warrior ethos they're all nonfiction. he's known as a mm. fiction writer but these are all nonfiction books phenomenal but but that's your point like how do we get better at synthesizing we have to we have to understand the difference between analysis and synthesis or how we have to meet analysis with synthesis and that and analysis is not enough and going back to john boyd he said if you call me an analyst it's one of the most offensive things that you could say to yes, me because what yes you're, you're telling me i'm a halfwit yeah i've only done half the job i've broken everything down and i'm staring at what he called the sea of anarchy and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not able to do anything because i can't synthesize mm -hmm. that is the difference between a winner and a loser in John Boyd's parlance. So a winner is someone that can synthesize and make that snowmobile. Hmm. A loser was somebody that could analyze, not synthesize, not make the snowmobile. That was a, that was a loser. And I, to me, it's just, I mean, it just dawned on me. It's like a, it's like a brilliant uh, explanation. You can see why he did so well with Marines because his, his theories are very simple. <laughs> right. I mean, you you're, they're you're, they're dealing with complexity. Um, it, it it it's very advanced complexity science. It's put in such simple terms that even Marines can understand it. So, <laughs> but but that to your point about cre you know creativity. How do I work on that? The synthesis. 
you've got to study design. I think mm. we talked about last time. You remember Boyd said, uh, a la Sun Tzu, you hit with Chang and you meet with Chi, right? Chang is the conventional, Chi is the unconventional, um, or creation and destruction, destruction and creation. Um, I think we talked about last time too, the three D's that my mentor taught, one of my mentors taught me how orientation changes. One is drift, like just natural mm -hmm. occurring time. My, my 46 year old self sees the world different than my 16 year old self, just mm -hmm. by the nature of passing 30 years. Um, and then the other two D's dis uh, disruption and design, and we've got to meet disruption and design An artist creates and destroys disrupts, uh, designs. Um, that's really the, I think that's how you, I would answer your question. How do we work on that creativity? We have to change our own orientation and mm -hmm. we have to influence those we're selling to those we're working with those we're partnered with. We have to constantly meet disruption with design Ooh. and show creation and destruction. Um, create, compete, compete, create. There's always that sort of balance. It's a very Eastern thing. And remember that Eastern philosophy uh, had a massive influence on Boyd, particularly later in his later in his life. And it feels like the the overarching thing here to me that is kind of sticking out is like once you're you're aware, it's basically the the symptom of being stuck is you're stuck inside essentially, and you're not you're not processing. And so it feels right. like the, once you're in a, you're in an OODA loop and you start thinking I'm I'm in an OODA loop, it's like a, a constant reminder. Hey, guess what? I'm in an OODA loop. I'm in a new loop that that mere awareness of and, and I guess that might be an orient thing where I'm in a new loop. OK, wake up. Uh, it's time. It's go time. So essentially, by even doing that, you're you're putting your your neurology into a, a, a sensory uh, type of uh, loop or, or kind of like you're turning the system on, so to speak, it feels like. Yeah, it, I you're 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 hitting it right on. I mean, because, again, we're always in that. Yeah. We're always we're always in that uh, paradigm, so to speak. We're always in that we're always in that process, and the artist, the the trader, the the business leader, the the star hockey player. Every time, throw on the overlay. There's a differentiated orientation that observed differently, decided, acted, and able to learn faster than their competition. Every single every single time. And the more mastery I have, the more awareness I have of how that process works, I can in turn use that to harness the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that I'm going to be subject to 100% of the time. Um, you, you kind of talked about too, uh, yeah, one thing that you said, I don't remember exactly, but it made me think of if I freeze, you've heard the yeah. proverbial deer in the headlights. Yes. Okay. The deer in the headlights analogy is it, it happens in sport. It happens in business. It happens everywhere where somebody just freezes and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, you ever see Miracle, the, the movie about the U.S. U.S. hockey the, team? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Where they're in that game and they're shifting lines in sort of an unconventional way. And, he, and, and Herb Brooks looks over at their bench like they don't know what to do. They don't understand what's going on. That's where you want to get your, you don't want to be that way. You want to uh, improve your situational awareness, your self-awareness, your situational awareness. And as you're doing that, and as you're cycling through, observe, orient, decide, act, learning faster than your component, your competitors or the rate of change, what you're avoiding is occurring over there. What you're managing or you're trying to overcome friction uh uh you're 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 cohesive you're you're disciplined you're trying to shatter that in your components in a or I'm sorry you're not components your competitors yeah in a uh in a competitive situation I know confusing you your opponent is a great way of of uh getting inside their OODA loop yeah you know Very you're good. You're you're shattering their correspondence with reality. You're causing confusion, mm. chaos, disorder, um, and what ended up happening? They they ended up losing. I mean, mm -hmm. you can take any situation where somebody wins and somebody loses, and we can go back and then analyze it, and we can see where the differentiation in the orientation occurred that empowered them to observe, orient, decide faster 
than their uh than their competition but that's that's really what it gets down to now that's not going to happen without all of the training and preparation and practice and uh and learning essentially right because what is practice if we're doing practice well we're learning we're Mm. we're as Boyd would said in Destruction and Creation, we're we're constantly seeking to improve our capacity for free and independent action. In a competitive situation, we're looking to disrupt the competitor's capacity for free and independent action. And when orientation locks or when orientation freezes, and I'm no longer able to function, my mm. my my uh, quote, you know, the proverbial OODA loop is crashed. You've heard right. people say that their yeah. OODA loop crashed. They don't know what to do. Um, Mark, I want to respect your time here. I feel like we could go on for another two hours on this and, and I feel like we will continue this discussion. Uh, if folks want to work with you, what's the best way to reach out to you? On LinkedIn. So okay. it's, uh, Mark J. McGrath and you'll see, um, LinkedIn, I'm the only one in Columbus, Ohio. And it, it, it says right in the tag that I teach, uh, leaders and teams, UDA and, and how to, take advantage of uh, VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity as, as, an, as an advantage and opportunity to become more competitive, collaborative, um, creative, and cooperative. And I, I put up a lot of ideas about what it is that we're, uh, that we're discussing about, because you'll see as you get into it, you can, you can, you're right. You could go on for hours and hours and, you know, we should have a, uh, maybe we could get a, a group of some other thinkers and have sort of a, uh, sort of a long form conversation about it because I, I would love to get punch on it. If we can, if we can yeah. find a time with uh punch and uh, anybody else you, you can think of that would love to pay. Cause this, I, I find it like r- ridiculously intellectually stimulating in that it, it, it is such a, a comprehensive again, and we're talking mental models. It's such a great way to start to kind of get cohesive about your mental models. And I, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> Think, it's so think fantastic. Of it, think of it this way: we could we could close with this. You know, the 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 culture, the military culture, and this is talked about in Quorum's biography. It's an oral culture, and it mm. comes from talking and learning from each other, up and down, laterally, um, and it does take some time. So Boyd would ask for a minimum of six hours to brief the uh, his famous brief patterns of conflict. Mm-hmm. And he would say full brief or no brief. So mm. that might like, as we're closing, that's something to be aware of that once you get into this and once you start trying to understand this, it, it doesn't stop. And you yeah. might be doing it already, by the way, you just don't know it. So let's yeah. say tra- trend following trading, right? There's probably a lot of trend following traders that have never heard of John Boyd or, mm. or they've never read any of his stuff, but they're essentially doing the same thing. They're constantly learning in order to adapt. They're constantly thinking. They're dedicated to lifelong learning. I haven't met one successful trader yet that's not a lifelong learner. I've, I've never met a successful portfolio manager in my mm-hmm. years of asset management that was not a, a thorough um, uh, expert in learning. I say expert. That's another Boyd term that he hated, but uh, a, a very proficient, effective learner. Um you have to commit to learning. If you don't learn, you don't adapt. If you don't adapt, you die. So um, that does take a lot of time. And when, I guess that's the the closing word is patience. You have mm-hmm. to have a lot of patience with this because to your point, it is stimulating and it does bring out a lot of things. And since orientation is literally everything, <laughs> um, it could take a lot of time and it yeah. never stops. So some of his briefs would go on for multiple days. And also did, uh, for the record, folks, if you like this and want to know more from uh, Colonel Board himself, I did find a, I think it was a 45-minute clip. I can't remember uh, exactly where he delivered it, but we do have some uh, Colonel Boyd stuff on the channel, and we're going to keep uh, keep our commitment to adding that in the uh, in the discussion here. So, uh, so here's a here's a quick prescription. Then I remember I give subscriptions, right? Yeah. Not prescriptions, but here's a here's a quick prescription. Download the PDF. It's free online. A discourse on winning and losing, and it's a compendium of all of John Boyd's briefs. Oof. If you go on YouTube and you can link to these. You could see uh, patterns of conflict uh, annotated with the slides that you can download. Mm. And it's that's provided by Dan Grazer, G-R-A-Z-I-E-R. Okay. He's a, also a uh, Marine. And he also put up 
um, uh, I think it's the strategic game. Mm. And you can follow along because the slides on the video aren't clear, but you can follow along. In fact, one of his patterns of conflict brief, Grazer has actually gone through and added updated clear slides. So you can follow oh. along the entire thing oh. and you can download. Um, you can see on YouTube Boyd walking through these briefs himself. And I mean, talk about a free class. That's going to change your life. Free <laughs> coursework. Yeah. Bam. There it Boom. is. And, you know, again, your tax dollars paid for it. So yeah. <laughs> Take advantage. Yeah. That's yeah, right. But you, you can do that today. Yeah. Um, I, I'm happy to help anybody that's earnestly interested in navigating this. So a lot of times when I'm working with leaders one-on-one -on -one or with teams and groups, I, I'll just use stuff from that and show them there and how mm -hmm. we can take an idea out of that and how we can, uh, how we can apply. But um, patterns of conflict, you could easily turn that to patterns of trading. You can mm -hmm. turn it to, uh, uh, you could you could take the warfare examples out. You could put the trading analogies in from Covell's books or Schwager's books or anything, and you could see the exact same patterns are at play. Why some win, why some lose. All the principles are are there. And like I said, I'm happy to guide anybody through that. So, take advantage, folks. Mark is a veritable uh, walking library of this stuff. And and again, Mark, I look forward to working with you. And further delving it, uh, delving into it, and, and sharing what you know. And I think the the crime to me is that people are just not. I, I and again, maybe it's a kind of a, a flip side as you maybe you don't want everybody to know about this stuff, but really, it's such an incredible uh, philosophy that I, I feel compelled to uh, to to sh help share your 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 life's work because you really have uh, crushed it, and I'm I'm excited to uh, to building your audience too because I, I think that people need to know you and, and learn from you on this. Well, it's uh, I'm on a mission to advance Boyd's work, and um, oftentimes where I've been dismissed with it, uh, their competitors didn't dismiss me. So <laughs> it's really it's really fun to help people in competitive situations. Yes. Um, and and when you see the light bulbs go off too, like, and you're like, man, yeah. So uh, yeah, and and by the way, you do when you're in competition, you absolutely want your competitors to dismiss this and think that yes. I'm crazy and that John Boyd was a quack and like what? Um, and that he was just some dude and it's not it's not pertinent and he didn't go to he didn't get his MBA or anything he doesn't mm. have a master's degree or a doctorate or whatever. Right. You want people to think that your competitors. You want your competitors to think that. That's okay, um, because if you've read his stuff, that's the losing side that's usually one of the uh stopping learning yeah. failure to learn is failure to adapt failure to adapt is uh, uh death is inevitable yes Ob obsolescence irrelevance is inevitable there you go and that's a mic drop moment for us mark thank you so okay. much for coming on i look forward to uh uh delving further thanks douglas always All great right. chatting with you uh, absolutely talk to you soon see ya